तिव सरंभा शंकराचार्य मध्यमा अस्मदाचार्य पर्यता वंदे गुरु परंपरा श्रुतिस्मृति पुराण आल करुणाल नमा भगवत्द शंकर लोकशंकर शंकर शंकराचार्य केशव बादरायण सूत्र भाष्य वंदे भगवत पुनः सहना सहना सह वीर वै तेजस्वीनाधीतमस्तु मद्विषा वै ओ शांति 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 And uh, twenty, no, twenty-two to twenty, twenty-two to thirty. Vasam sijir nani yatha vihaya, navani grinhati na roparani, tatha sharirani vihaya jir nani, anyani sanyati navani dehi. नयन छिंद शस्त्राणि नयन दहति पावक न चैन क्लेदयप न शोषयति मारुत अच्छेदमदा अक्लेदोष्य निर्वगतस्थाणु अचलोय सनातन अव्यक्तोयमचिंत्योय अविकार्योयमुच्य तस्व विदिवैन नाशोचिमर्हसी अथ चैन निमसे मृत तथा पिम महाबा नोचिमर्हसी जात हि ध्रुव मृत्यु ध्रुव जन्म मृत तस्मादरिहार्ये नोचिमर्हसी अव्यक्तादी भूता व्यक्तमध्या भारत अव्यक्त तात्र त्र का पिदेवना आश्चर्यवत्पश्यति कश्चिदेन आश्चर्यवती तथा चान्य आश्चर्यवचैन्मशृणती श्रुवाप्यन वेद न चि देमध्योय देहे सर्वस्य भारत तस्मा भूता नोचिमर्हसी फंडामेंटल challenge a human being faces is that he is in constant <coughs> desire for happiness constant seeking for happiness and therefore even the thought of not getting some happiness anticipatory brings about sadness 
which here the Shastra is qualifying as grief. So, grief is a symbolic mood, emotion represented. To say that it is undesirable, but it is also a universal emotion that is experienced by everyone. All living forms experience grief. Animals also experience grief. Humans certainly do. As far as human perception goes, grief seems to be a very universal, acknowledged emotion. Tastra Drishti is. It is not saying that grief is not an acknowledged emotion. What it says is that when grief overwhelms the thinking of what is right and what is wrong, when it upsets, topples the capacity to lead one's life, to discern what is right and wrong for oneself correctly. That grief state is not acceptable. It is fine from our human standpoint to say, yes, there is grief. But from the standpoint of the reality, from the drishti of one's nature, accepting grief as a state of oneself emotion is as acknowledging that one wishes to remain in the realm of or continue in the realm of looking for happiness and never come to the conclusion that maybe happiness is not something to be sought. Maybe happiness is actually one's nature to be discovered. To be able to come to that fact, one will have to reorient one's mindset. That grief, even if it is vyavharikali accepted for us in Jeeva Drishti, from Shastra Drishti, it is not acceptable. A, he has given us the reason. Because by nature, Atma is Nityam, Avikari, etc. And therefore, from that standpoint, those who know this as one's nature, there is no amount of change that can affect one's nature. Grief is a change in one's mind. That change is not seen, is not there. It's not there. However difficult it may be for us to accept this. Fact remains from the standpoint of the knowers of Atma, Grief is not an emotion felt. It is acknowledged in understanding that if you are not knowing your nature, you will have grief. So the knowers of Atma are not cold hearted or are not condemning. If there is grief experience, they have a, in fact, the opposite. They have a lot of compassion. They have a lot of kindness. They have a lot of genuine emotion of encompassing, born from understanding, an emotion that rests in understanding. What is the understanding? That if you are experiencing grief, that grief is only acknowledged as a child having grief for losing a toy or not getting a toy or any of those states of mind that a child feels. A happy child suddenly feels at the thought of a loss of its child, tremendous grief, and how a parent looks at a child's mind at that stage, 
you will not condemn, you will not correct, you will not educate a child at that point. You simply understand that this grief is inevitable for the child. A child is attached to its toy and you don't try to educate a child and say, no, you should not be attached, no, your state of, as an adult, you will be finding it foolish, therefore now itself you should not have attachment for your toy, etc. You don't talk like that to a child. If you are a truly mature adult in a child's environment, you understand, you give time to the child, you let the child grow in its own capacity, constantly maneuvering child's mind and you understand that one day child will also become an adult and will also look at another child in the same way. Just as you are able to look at another child, you were looked upon by an adult at another point, you were crying for a toy, your adult in the environment let you grow in the same way you are letting another child grow and in time this child will grow and will let another child grow. In this manner, grief, this is a very, very leaping thought process for a human being. Grief, struggle, dukh, jisko hum kehte hai. Wherever it is experienced and there is an adult means a knowledgeable person there who understands these facts of life, they do not correct us, they do not discourse us on your nature as Atma, they give you the information and let you grow in time. So from the standpoint of Atma, Krishna has given us this knowledge already. In the verses that from 12 to, where was it, 12 to up to 25, the whole portion of Atma he has elaborated and left it to us to digest. That in time we will also be able to recognize our Paramarthik Swaru and thereby grief will vanish as per the Praman validity shown by the scripture. But yes, just as a child, we are spiritual infants, Adhyatmic Bala Avastha most of us are in. Therefore, Krishna, knowing that Arjuna is also in a similar situation, he continues to tell him that what do you think of yourself if you do not see of yourself as Atma? And this brings us straight into the realm in the middle of the battlefield in our context of life. Just as Arjuna is in the middle of his battlefield, the minute we are asked the question, what do you think of yourself if, you're, if you don't see yourself as Atma? How do you know yourself? Define yourself. How do you feel about yourself, your identity? What do you think about your existence? If you were to start Understanding, what do you think about your existence? Who are you? What are you? Then instantly, the thought is, I am an individual. I am a jiva. Jiva is a word Shastra gives us. In English, we understand it better. I am an individual. I am separate from you. I am different from you. I am my own self. I am my own identity. I have my own likes and dislikes. I have my views. I have my perspective. I have my ideologies. I have, I am my own bundle and I'm different from you, period. There is no discussion on this. You and I are not same. You and I are not in no manner are same. In fact, we get into arguments or we look for harmony and affection outside because we hope that we will find someone who's like us because we are all different people. And when, our, when we clash in our opinions, we fight. Is that not enough Brahman to say that we are separate from each other? Therefore, O oh Krishna, Arjuna is saying and we are all saying, this is how we see ourselves. I am a limited being. I am a small entity. 
मैं बहुत छोटा हूं इस संसार में मैं बस एक व्यक्ति हूं मैं बस एक एंड ये सब मुझसे अलग है मेरे से बाहर है एंड to some people i have a fine relationship with and have a lot of happiness with them and with some people my relationships are sour over time and i am not so happy in that relationship but we are all different people and this is accepted about us then is grief not going to be legitimate if i am sad sometimes if i am unhappy sometimes if i am struggling sometimes what does shastra tell me then am i acceptable over here as is shastra says of course you are acceptable just as you accept a child losing a toy but is that truly an unavoidable or non correctable state of mind i'll repeat if i say i am feeling unhappy or sad etc and i ask krishna back is this not acceptable after all i have had a loss etc or whatever and i am unhappy should i not be grieving is it not fine is it not valid krishna says it is fine it is valid as much as the child is fine is grieving over a lost toy but is it not correctable is it not avoidable can you should you be living with it or accepting it and in nature let it happen its course and things like that is it a correctable emotion is my experience of grief correctable emotion means i can have it it's okay but should i instantly get out of it should i correct my thinking should i do something so that i can see the invalidity of that emotion it's a very subtle point i think so because most of us if we look at it from our vyavharik drishti then we will see no way out of this emotional roller coasters that we experience in vyavhar they are emotional roller coasters with some people we are happy with some people we are not so happy this is an acceptable fact but shastra vidya tells us that it is acceptable is fine but is it not correctable is that state of emotion to be left as is acceptable therefore i don't make a change in it is it to be like that shastra says no it is not to be like that even if you look at yourself from the point of i am an individual and i have relations i have a life i am different from that standpoint also grief is illogical i use the word illogical it's unjustifiable and the any one of us who will grow into this perception will instantly find a lot of stability within ourselves because we have corrected a default thinking that i can be free of i cannot be free of grief or unhappiness it's a default in us that it's okay to be unhappy shastra says it is okay is fine i go along abhyupa ve ab vipagamya vada i accept it but i would want us i would want you to grow further shastra says what is the growth further it is accepted but i can grow out of it i don't have to have it 
I have freedom from it. The minute I understand I have, I can be free of this state, I can put an end to it, then I need to know on what ground should I put an end to my grieving state? What is the logic? What is the knowledge? Karan kya hai? I should not grieve. In a child's case, Karan kya hai? Jaisi jaisi uski buddhi ka vikas hoga, jaisi jaisi bada hoga, uska mind bade toys mein involve ho jayega, chote toys ko wo apne aap uska loss grief nahi karega. What is the praman? Jaisi jaisi buddhi ka vikas hoga, as the understanding grows in a child, the child will not grieve over the loss of the toy because the mind has got involved with another set of toys, bigger toys. He will not cry over the small artificial toy car because he now plays with a bigger car which he calls as real. When he didn't have the idea of that bigger car, the small car was real. That toy car was real. So it affected when that toy car, this little car got damaged or got lost. He didn't need correction of that living in that realm of reality. His correction happened automatically when he entertained another realm of reality, when he was involved with the greater realm of reality. Uddhi ka jab vikas hua, so automatically grief was not, is not an experience anymore with reference to the toy car. In the same way, similarly, exactly like that, Buddhi ka jab yaha vikas hota hai, amari buddhi ka jab vikas hota hai, to what is real, then automatically the grief of this realm dissolves away. It's no longer felt. What is that logic? Buddhi ka vikas kaise hoga? He says, even within this realm, look at things from their standpoint and perspective. From their standpoint and perspective, things change. There is nothing steady. I've just seen a Netflix documentary on the Nepal 2015 earthquake. The vision is very vivid here. The Valley, I've forgotten the name. Forgotten the name. Lachung Latung Sam Valley. They showed the picture. Before the earthquake. Morning, some person had left. It's a documentary, so they showed the village. It's a village. Proper village was there. It still probably is now proper village, a place, beautiful place for trekkers, hikers. Immediately after the devastation, after the earthquake, raised into the ground, the photograph is so distinct. The photograph is so loud in its language. What was green had houses, had hustle, had bustle, had life. A tourist place, hikers sought it. Within few minutes, disappeared. No house seen, no life seen. There are just remnants, some bodies sometimes, and some remnants of trunks and things like that. It's fascinating. In the realm of reality, where your body is real and the sense involvement are real, wanting to come out of struggle and grief from that realm, 
your perception has to grow to the realm of what is a deeper reality. Those houses, that village, was it real always? It had people living even moment before. Some people were there in the morning, had just taken to a higher place, left for a hike, and from top when they see, gone. This is a reality of this changing phenomenon, world, when you are associated with the body. We will see it and we will forget it. This has happened, we have forgotten. Life may have flourished, continued. But is the reality any different? Kiranath floods. Is the reality changing from its, means it's going to be eternally there, changing from that fact that it changes? Is the reality going to now get altered to our wish that up now that we have this, this will last forever? Is that ever going to be real? That it will be there forever? And yet, when we contact the world, we contact it with a sense of reality of it. That it will last. Knowing that it has, we are on fragile grounds. Life is fragile. The expression of life in the body is fragile. It's so fragile, it's so thinly balanced that any one element here and there from your body and you're gone. The No longer life ex exhibiting here. You choke yourself for a little while, you're gone. You drown yourself, you're gone. Any of the elements can affect. We just saw that. Tindanti, Tastrani, Dahati, Pavakaha, Edhyantyapaha, Shoshayataha, Shoshayati. This association with the body and the felt reality is not a matter of discussion in a Vedanta class. It is not a matter of just note writing. It's not a matter of believing that maybe it's a relevant understanding of a reality around us now. Interesting is, next verse we are coming to it. Shastra says, even after being taught and heard, how soon we forget it. It is a devastation. Forget that. The recent times, how many lives were affected because of Corona. But how quickly we think we are bouncing back. How quickly we have engaged back into what we call as normal life. Our definition of normal life is what? Our definition of normal life is the freedom to go anywhere, eat anything, be anywhere at any expense. We are so confined in our vision of what is life. We can only look at the world, seeing the world as inert, and with an idea of a consumerist attitude. Mara fayda kya hai? We only look at that much. But when nature plays its role and it shows us our place, at that time we all become philosophers for a short time. For a little while we all learn, we start valuing relations. How, you know, when Corona came in the first, second wave, especially. Our friendships got deeper, our relations got important and, you know, we understood the value of life and our language changed. Our behavior had changed. How long did it last? 
now that things are getting normalized again, how much with the vengeance as if we have bombarded the planet again? With a similar attitude, same knowledge, same attitude, absolutely the same thinking, if anything, stronger, because as if we were denied some pleasures for one year, two years, we've gone stronger into it. Krishna is telling us, Gita is not a word of theory. It is a transaction of knowledge of things as they are. And the one who holds that vision, even relative here, in time I will grow to understand I am Atma. Like a child will grow in time to understand that the toy world is not real. I will grow in time. Now I see things around me as real. My relations are precious. They hurt me. I look for joy. They impinge upon my freedom. They curb me. They suffocate me. They give me joy. They give me all this is happening with with my relations, my life around me, I want this, I want to go here, I want to do this, that, but all of it will not go as per our plan, as per our wish. However much we may want a situation designer cut to our likes and dislikes, it is not going to happen. Most situations in our life will not be designer cut to our wish. I want it this way, therefore, it should be like that. It will not happen like that. It cannot happen like that is what Shastra is telling us. And the one who is able to appreciate this, that even if I look upon myself as a body and a Dehi here, who is born and who is gone as a Jeeva, if I look upon myself as an individual, even then, I think my grief is justified. Shastra says, expand your buddhi, expand your knowledge, expand your understanding of life. And when you look at it from that standpoint, you cannot alter the law of life. And the law is, it is change. What prompts the change? Should be a deeper question. Is this change absolutely changelessly not in my control or are there some elements that are there in my control regarding the change? The world is going to be changing. Nothing seems to be sometimes in my hand and you know when you look at that documentary sometimes they were very qualified people who felt a moment of complete helplessness and because Arjuna is so real to us through the study, the helplessness is no different from Arjuna's helplessness to now as recent as now that you see. Qualified people. They were masters in their own sense. They were uh, whatever. The point is, how prepared are we to align our life, our choices, to carve our life, be an architect of a life, following the niyam of life, following the law of life. Are we creating a life, our life? Are we building our life based upon acceptance of a fact? Those who are able to base it, Shastra says, even they will not have grief. And what is the factor that is there which is controlling the change? That factor is very difficult to fathom. In third chapter, he's going to say, but only thing that can control change or protect you from change or affect your change is 
your karma phal. Eat it. That's all. It's not up to our hand to see how our karmas and karma phalas are interacting and what is happening. We can't discern that from standing from the standpoint of an individual. Because already the individual says you and I are different. So we cannot fathom the movement of karma phal and how it generates an environment, how it creates the change. But that is an inevitable factor that can be managed from your end. What is a factor that can be managed from our end? As long as we see ourselves as an individual who will be born, who will be gone, who will die, Shastra says, in this realm of understanding of yours, one factor alone plays importance to the degree of your environmental fructification of conduciveness or non-conduciveness, which means happiness or not so happiness, not so much happiness. And that factor is your karma. As long as you are in a deha feeling I am an individual, only thing that can affect your experiences is if I have managed to carve a life, architect my life based on the knowledge of what is right karma, what is ordained, what is not ordained, etc, etc. What is etc, etc? As per dharma, principles of life, if I am following those principles, Krishna says, O oh Arjuna, if you are following the principles, you should not grieve. Why? Because the law is, change will be conducive for you. If you are following the principles. If you are following what you are ought to be doing within the confines of dharma. Like in that documentary, there was one Israeli who broke a chest. Uh, chest and he found a lot of saved money, Nepali currency, villagers. And they experienced a lot of hostility from the locals because he thought, he justified that I am going to take this and maybe give it to them. He, he felt his intentions were not wrong. But the locals felt it was completely wrong for him to even have touched that. Broke open. Broke the lock. lock. A difficult situation. You can hear and you know when you see that you see where the cultural differences arise. Thinking is different. For them Survival was important and anything for survival is justified. The locals whose loss was the most unfathomable still felt differently. Under a situation like that where you think your individuality is under a stress of life or death situation, what course of action do you take? Sure enough. Shastra says, if you are taking the correct course of action, even in difficult times of your life, you have nothing to worry. You don't have to grieve. You have nothing to worry or be concerned about because by the very law, if you are doing the right today, it is impossible that there will be something wrong happening to you. One person chance even if something happens. 
wherever there is duk that you are experiencing. Shastra says, it is not that nature is punishing you for it. It's a wrong thought. That environment is there for you to grow from it. Overcome your limitation in your understanding and grow in it. Be more closer to your complete nature. So nature is never ever punishing you. It is only expressing an opportunity. Change is an opportunity to change yourself, to grow yourself for the better. It's an opportunity. So he says, Krishna, even if you think you are an individual and if you are following the niyamas of life, carving your life, following the principles of life, you don't have to worry. Whatever next environment opens will only be beneficial for you, will only be better for you. You cannot slip into a negative lower state of life and all these warriors who had gathered there in their context were all fighting from their standpoint Virgati etc etc so nobody Bhishma and Drona and all these people had lived such a careful diligent life that it was no way that they would not have a better plan, a better place and environment in the next, once the body dies. There would only be better. So why are you grieving, Arjuna? They are only going to go to a better place. Will you grieve for it if you go to a better place? So if anyone who has lived a life as ought to be lived, there is no grief for them. You ought not to have grief. It's improper. He says, na arhasi. It's improper to grieve for them. Galat hai. You should not grieve for them. It's improper. It's illogical. It's not called for. And if you have by some mistake, by some error, not led a diligent life fully, you have slipped sometimes, even then you don't have to grieve. Because the environment, wherever you are, is only conducive for your growth. What do we mean by environment is conducive for your growth? It is the only place which is helping you grow your understanding of things, life, and come to terms with it. Once you come to terms with fundamentals of life as they are, automatically the struggles are lesser. So he says, you don't have to grieve because whatever is born, jatasya hi dhruvaha, is certain. If you think I'm born, this thinking means death is certain for you. But if you know yourself as Atma, then you will not even think I am born. So there is no death. But if there is born, then death is the second side of the coin. You can't avoid it. And for what dies, again the coin flips. Birth is inevitable for that. This chakra say, janam vrityu ka chakra end nahi hoga. It's not culminating till Atma Vidya is there. So, what is the next step best? He says, understand, grow, grow your knowledge, grow your Vivek Shakti. Grow your maturity of thinking and abide in that maturity 
live with that mature thinking, thereby also you will not have any grief. So in other words, grief only amounts to immature thinking. Immature here is not to be taken in a negative, childish way of how English language is conveying immaturity. Immature means you still need to buddhi ka vikas karna zaruri. Buddhi mein abhi, your buddhi is holding on to life toys. And all grief has only come about as he's explained to us in the beginning only. Aham ete, mama ete, esham, I am this, these are my people. Your grief is only from relations, situations, relations. My situation, my relation, correction is, and it's a long process if one is forgetting this fact, like you forget what can nature do to even human beings, however powerful we think ourselves to be. If we break laws, we have consequences. So, if we are not understanding clearly that this is a realm of change and I can only maximize the life. What does that maximizing life really mean? Abhyaktadin. It is unmanifest before, manifest, unmanifest later. life is an opportunity to do as much possible. Your karmas need to be corrected. Your attitudes need to be proper, corrected as per Shastra. It's like saying, collect whatever you need to collect in this life opportunity that you have a small window. Even a got chota, like uh, my visualization is, you know, when the winters, there is this layer of ice in cold places and there are fishes and everything, they live there. And for air, sometimes they pop up like that. They break the ice and they come up. You know, you can just see the head and then they go back again inside. Life is like that, an opportunity. A momentary expression. Actually, we may think we have lived 60, 70, 80, 90 years. It is just a momentary expression of doing the right thing, correcting the right thing, accumulating whatever. If you think you are an individual, and what is the highest thing that you can really do the right thing? Engage that opportunity to know who you are. So from both standpoints, he says, if you are a wise person, you will use your life correctly so that by the time the last breath is there, you can turn back and say, no regrets. I lived well. I did what had to be done. Now I will only get the rewards. It's like, you know, when you prepare for an exam, as students, when we prepared for exam, who are the ones who are most scared of the examination day? Who is the most scared of the examination day? Don't study. Who are not prepared? Who are not, who have not studied, who are not prepared? But those who have studied and are prepared, how do you look at your examination day? You know you've done and you do a paper the best you can. Jitna padha hai, usi mein se ab last minute to kuch nahi kar sakte, na? So you prepare and now what do you know? You know the result. So many people on the result day go to Ishwara. I mean, go to temples, coconut tote hai, aaj, aaj amara result achha hai ga. Heart to heart, of course, you don't say it aloud, but heart to heart you... Smile because your result was set on the day you wrote your paper. This will only be an outcome. God can't change it just now. You go to your temple now and it's not going to influence the mark sheet. 
your mark sheet has got determined the day you wrote the examination paper. That's the time the mark sheet was already there. It will get trishtam on the result day. Phal will become drisht on the result day. But the fal had already been processed on the examination day. And how well did you do the examination? Was already processed on the preparation that preceded it. How well were you prepared? That's life. How well are you prepared to live life? How when situations come, etc., etc., how well are you facing them or how are you facing them? The result is only going to come trishtam, abhyakta, vyakta, abhyakta. Abhyakta means unmanifest. You can't see. Then it becomes vyakta. You can now see it's manifest. And then once again, the result is abhyakta, gone. So he says, for those who understand the name of life, they don't grieve because there so many people, especially in our country or in our culture, karma is taken in a very negative way. Oh, if anything bad happens only, then people talk of karma, karma. They give you a very wrong impression of prarabdha and things like that. You know. Karma is, is uh, it's as if a divine tool. It's the only tool. Third chapter and fourth chapter make it very clear. Karma is a divine tool. It's a it's nothing less than a miracle maker. Karma is a miracle maker. People who say, no, miracle, miracle, I want a miracle. Ah, your miracle is in your capacity to do karma. How you do your karma determines the miracles in life. So he says, who understands and lives a life as diligently as possible, such people, they use karma. They use the right attitudes. They keep following the niyamas of life. They don't have the arrogance to say, we will see when the situation comes. We will see when the whatever happens, let it. They are not charvaka thinking. What is the charvaka thinking? I am born, I will die. Enjoy life. There is no right, no wrong, no moral, no ethics, no nothing here. Everything is justified. Therefore, each one to their own self. You earn your happiness, I will earn my happiness. You work for yourself, I work for myself. That's it. What does Shastra say? Shastra will say, Working for yourself, everyone has to do. Look after yourself, everybody has to do. But there are niyamas. What are the niyamas? Living in a society, living as a member of creation, take only that much that you have given. In other words, give more than you are taking. It is one of the principles of your karma. If you are focusing your life only on the principles, if my fundamental principle is let me give more than I take, then also you should not grieve when the body dies. Because you know what was to be done was done. There was nothing more you can do. Now it's only be an exam, a result day. That result day is an outcome of how you lived. Therefore, since what is born will die and in between you lived life as best as you should be living, 
not from Shochatam Arhase. There is no possibility of grief here. Knowledge, expansion of buddhi is the perception that change is possible any moment. And what I have today, what opportunity I have today, how best can I bring it to my adhyatmic gati along with other things. So he says, therefore, in the 28th verse, he says, what is there? Tatra ka pari devana. This is a law of life. Whatever is unmanifest, manifest, goes back to unmanifest. This cyclical change is unavoidable, not alterable, not controllable by you in the sense that you want to change the cycle, but it is controllable by you in the sense that you can change it at the level of your own effort and cause, which is your karma. If you focus on that, there is no reason to grieve even then. He kind of concludes the topic here. And in 29th and 30th verse, it concludes the whole topic. And 29th verse, he says, Ascharyavat Pashyati Kaschat Enam. From both standpoints, from standpoint of Paramarthic Drishti, you are Atma. From the standpoint of Vyavharic Drishti, you are an individual, you are a Jiva. From both these standpoints, those who know the truth, as has been said now in the previous verses, they marvel at it. Ascharya lagta hai. Ascharya vat looks like it is a wonderment. It's, it's uh, marveling. Ascharya is the right word. Koibi cheez ascharya kab lagti hai? Some say, you know, becomes uh, when you are not, when does it become like a wonderment? The seven wonders of the world. What is the wonderment about the seven wonders of the world? And now I'm sure there won't. But what is a wonderment there? Adbut lagta hai. Wonderment means adbut hona. What is adbut there? Ascharyavat pashyati. Come see this context of Atma itself as a wonder. The topic itself is a wonderment. Atma is truly nityam. Aisa kuch hai. I am that Atma. Akarta, abhukta. It's a disbelief kind of a thing. It's marveling. Aisa kuch hota hai. If you look at it from there, it is ascharya. He says, it also is spoken of as Ashcharya. Those who know it are also reveling. They don't know. It's Ashcharya. How do you communicate this? How do you convey this to someone? Atma is Apramaya. How do you talk about it? About this. It's so unbelievable, it's so unacceptable, it's so different from what everybody thinks. Nobody imagines that I can be Atma. Nobody can even think in the wildest dream till somebody tells us. Ascharyavat adbhutam akasma drishyamanam and suddenly when something comes in a view, like Himalayas, Ascharya, 
suddenly magnitude of it overwhelms your senses. How is it possible? The depths of the ocean, space, these are all Ashtarya. This is Atma is like that. Some people, Ashtaryavat, they look at the topic itself as Ashtarya. Some people talk of about it as Ashcharya, Tatha, Eva, Cha, Anya. Other people talk of it as Vadati, talk of it as Ashcharya. Ashcharya, but the Enam, Anya, Shrunoti. Some people who are listening is also Ashcharya. In other words, there are two levels at which he says is Ashcharya. One is the very topic pertaining to Atma is Ashcharya. Bolne wale Ashcharya hai ki koi uske baare mein sikhane wala bhi hai. There are, there are parampara teachers, parampara which is telling us about this. It's an Ashcharya. How it is surviving, Bhagwan knows. Because it's not a popular topic. How is the knowledge still available to us? It's an Ashcharya. When we say it's Sanatanam, it really is an Ashcharya. It despite so many changes that come, this knowledge becomes available to the real seeker. How it unfolds in a life of a true seeker, it remains Ashcharya. Suddenly everything opens up. Ashcharya. The knowledge comes in your life. It's an Ashcharya. How it happened? How did that situation arise? Where did the teaching come from? Where did the teacher come from? Everything becomes like a big surprise. How did the right thing happen? Ashcharya. Ashcharya vat vadati. Ashcharya that the parampara is there, the teaching is there. Ashcharya that there are people interested in it. How can a teacher talk if there's nobody interested? If people are not listening to it with the understanding that yes, this is right, this could be right. If they don't have belief in it, shraddha in it, agar bar bar, roz roz, hafte bar hafte, saal bar saal, if you still find yourself fascinated with the topic, it's fascinating. How can you be fascinated when Atma is not even a known topic? Why is still it holding your interest? Why does it still hold any student for that matter, any seeker? Why are people ready to give up their jobs and their families and go live in situations that are difficult for a normal human being? Why would anybody be interested in it? When all you know is you are born and you will die. What fascinates about this topic? Why is Vedantic knowledge still so popularly accepted? When actually... Nobody understands it clearly enough, at least initially. Then the mind is sitting in the mind, the mind is sitting in the mind, the mind is sitting in the mind. It is right, it is not right, but it is right. I may not fully appreciate, but I think this is, this is what I should follow. I think this is what I will invest my time and energy in. I need to know this. I don't understand this. I need to, I need to know this. Ashcharya. When Atma is always going to be a Prameya, not objectifiable. And then he says in the last, Tutva api enam vedana chaiva cha eva kashchari. Having heard also, it remains an Ashcharya. That no one knows it. It remains an Ashcharya that no one um, no one understands it. Everyone is made a lot of people may find it fascinating, but having heard it also, no one can know it. As, of course, as an object, nobody can know it. But having heard, it's a very, very rare one. The idea he wants to say here in this verse is, 
that the topic of Atma is subtle. Your interest, if it is there, it is, it is there, it is bhagyam, it is pursuit is rare. And having heard it also, it is not something that you can just immediately say, I have understood. Till the perception goes through mananam, goes through self-correction, till then, Atma Vidya doesn't get established. So, Ascharyavat Pashyati Kaschit Enam. Some hold it as Ascharya. See it as an Ascharya. Those who know it are Ascharya. The topic of Atma is Ascharya. Those who speak of it is Ascharya. Those who are interested in it is Ascharya. And it is Ascharya that what is self-evident Atma still misses our perception. Ideally, the whole methodology is such a clear process that it should be effortless. Atma Vidya should be effortless. It's an Ascharya that such clarity despite having, it still eludes us. We still remain with the Jeeva Bhav. We still think I'll be born, I'll be born. That I, I, I am dying, that I'm suffering, and I am etc. etc. That Jeeva Buddhi still lingers, still continues. Therefore, of course, the Shastra and the Parampara says, as compassionate as Shruti is, as the Shastra is, they repeat and 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 they repeat. The Kabir Doha, Pathar Dhi, a constant rumbling through the, say, from the, it starts from Gangotri. The pebble rumbles, it's a rough pebble by the time it reaches Allahabad's Bay of Bengal, it's become a pebble. Constant beating of the water on it eases its outer surface and makes it smooth. Constant hearing of Vedanta in the sense of the Prakriya. Correction, constant correction is like working on the stone constantly. Your mind is all the time getting purified. The process therefore continues and the acharyas say, therefore, the learning continues. And so is Krishna here going to also say it. In the 30th verse, he is now concluding it, concluding the whole topic. This Dehi Nityama Abhatyaha Ayam. This Dehi, the indweller, whether you call it Jiva, or you call it Atma. Atma for sure is Avadhyam. Real Dehi. It is not something that can be killed. It is Niravayavatva. It is without parts. It is being Nityam. Avadhyaha. You cannot kill it. So too, even your Jeeva Bhav cannot be killed by any of these elemental forces or from anything from the outside world. Aapka ahankar hai, aapka mein hai, jo mein ka perception hai, this also cannot be destroyed by any force. You cannot destroy it by a force. You can only destroy it in right knowledge. So, ahankar bhi kahi nahi jara. Jeeva bhav kahi nahi jayega. It is as if nityam there. It has an end only when there is a correction of aham bhav itself with atma vidya. Till then, atma is also not dying. Jeeva is also not dying. 
in this body dehi is not dying diable you cannot destroy it o bharata o arjuna tasmat sarvani bhutani so too is applicable to all the beings sarvasya prani jatasya dehi all those that are pranis with bodies only the body will die belonging to matter belonging to elements it's only a change of the body they he will not die it is avadhyam tasma therefore natvam shochitum arhasi makes it a final conclusion he says you should not leaving the 30th verse now he finally says na tvam shochitum arhasi in this manner that has upset your entire rationality you cannot grieve arjuna it's a niyam of life what is born will die and if you have lived as good a life as Bhishma and Drona have lived. For them, you certainly should not grieve because they have earned a better place for themselves. In the next change that is happening for them, they will only be in a better place. Why will you grieve? किसी के साथ कुछ अच्छा हो रहा है, कोई बदलाव उसके लिए अच्छा होगा, तो why will should you grieve? Right? Correct. Right. 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 Right तुमने अच्छा जीवन जिया है सही जीवन जिया है और अब चेंज आ रहा है सही जीवन जीने वाले के लिए शुड यू ग्रीव ओ इसने कितना अच्छा जीवन जिया फील सो सैड यू विल नॉट ग्रीव फॉर द पर्सन एज वी सेड इन द प्रीवियस क्लास वी ग्रीव फॉर अवर लॉस अवर डिसोसिएशन दैट इज हैपनिंग वी ग्रीव फॉर दैट Krishna says, even that you should not grieve because it just doesn't justify the person who lived well. Your loss, if you are grieving, you should not also grieve because you also need to grow in your understanding and abide by the principle of life, and that makes one's buddhi achal. He is going to come to that. it makes it sthit na tvam shochitum arhasi therefore o arjuna do not this is the state of existence from sat onwards he started in a very logically presentable understanding atma is sat you should not grieve all this is asat you should not grieve if from the standpoint of your deha body body is to die you should not grieve if from the standpoint of dehi as an individual you see yourself not as atma then you should not grieve grief is a sign of is a lakshana of samsari buddhi it's a sign of samsara therefore arjuna raise your stature raise yourself uttishtha he is going to say raise your understanding live with a higher understanding live with a higher purpose live with a higher knowledge live your life on better conditions and grounds than what is swabhavik available in jeev drishti स्वाभाविक अवेलेबल इन जीव दृष्टि ये मेरे और वो तेरे एंड यू नो ऑल दैट जो संसार में झगड़ा होता है इवन इन स्पिरिचुअल इंस्टीट्यूट्स एंड आश्रम्स जीव बुद्धि डजेंट गेट करेक्टेड इट रिमेन्स मर्की एंड इट रिमेन्स इवन फॉर इवन इन भक्ताज सपोजिंग द राग द्वेश डजेंट गो अवे अहंकार डजेंट गेट करेक्टेड therefore says 
raise your standard of approach to living life. Highest is Atma Vidya. Raise towards that direction at least. If you aspire for it, nothing like it. There's nothing higher to aspire for. Else, aspire enough to qualify for it. And the first step for that is, this grief is a lakshana that you are jivatham me jakde hoye ho. Tum apne ahankar ko pakde hoye ho. You are not ready for self-correction. You are not ready for shishyaste ham. You are not ready to be a student of life. You are not ready to be a student of life and learning. Because you are holding your individuality very firmly and your sense of you are rigidly holding on. So, therefore do not grieve for Bhishma and all these people, O Arjuna. And from next verse, he has already said, Parmartha Tattva Pekshaya Shoka Moha Na Sambhavati. Paramarthic Na Sambhavati. Not only Paramarthic, he says, even Jivatvam, there is no Shoka and Moha possible. But also brings in now the third point, which I have just introduced today. From the standpoint of your karma, if you are living a proper life, you will see you don't have grief. You never regret difficult situations in your life. You never regret making difficult choices. You never regret if you had to do something, you had to do, even if it looked not vyavharikali proper. What had to be done, had to be done kind of a buddhi when you have and you do what you have to do. Someone just said, hashtag tough love, like that. When you take tough decisions, it's hashtag tough love. So you're becoming a tough master over there because what has to be done, has to be done. You can't have emotions cajoling situations sometimes. It's not necessary. So now he's going to say from your personal standpoint, Arjuna. And that brings us to all of us immediately also. There are three levels at which he's smashing samsara buddhi. Oh, you're listening, is it? Then realize. He's smashing it. Sorry, he's saying it from the standpoint of the individual also. Your duty and for all of us, all our duties, from those standpoint as limited as your own individual self, from the standpoint of your karma, when you stick to doing that, you will realize grief doesn't come. I found this the most difficult to convey and I almost get defensive sometimes because I have to convey what the Shastra says but in the world people give you blank looks and they give you the turn back and say it's impossible not to grieve and then you go into quiet mode and defensive mode. it's okay if you don't like you know let the child take its time to understand but there is no two doubts that Shastra Vidya says any grief I am now adding to say if you feel grief, you are almost, there is only an attitude, you are almost insulting Bhagwan's gift of life to you. The gift of life that you have, you are insulting that gift. If grief is there, no situation of life demands 
extended period of grief is what I am accommodating. Kastra says, grief is only not proper. I am only trying to draw a middle line somewhere. Okay, fine. But to be a true representative of the knowledge, no grief should be encouraged. That state of mind needs correction. You can't linger in it. Mistakes made happen. Things happen. All this is acceptable. Accept the outcomes as a part of your karma phal. Live with those attitudes that he's going to now start talking. And he's shifting now slowly into the realm of karma. From 12th verse, Atma Vidya, Vyavhara, Deha Buddhi, and now your own karma buddhi. Identify what should be your karma buddhi. Other shastra gyan me upar se miss hota ja raha hai. So this is the lowest point from where shastra vidya gives you an entry in life. Karam buddhi ko pe paklo. What should be my karma buddhi? If you even identify your karma buddhi and live a life on that, you are already on the right track. There will be no grief. There will be no occasion for grief in your life. Things will just keep happening your, the right way in your life. Things will just unfold, even if they unfold not so right way. In heart to heart, there is prasad buddhi of the situation. We do not know. Jeeva Buddhi is coming from many janmas. I am holding the Jeeva Buddhi in many bodies. I have gained many experiences. I have done a lot of dharma, dharma, collected a lot of things. By the time you come to this Vedantic knowledge, you just get the capacity to accept an adverse situation as only your own earning. And you let it tide away without interfering too much. That's how a karam buddhi identified helps in every way possible. So now he is going to say we'll do this tomorrow. He says even looking at your own standpoint Arjuna, look at it from the standpoint of what should you be doing. Tumhara karam kya banta hai? Tumhe kya is situation mein karna chahiye? And all of us have these situations in our life where we all have a role to play. Identify that role. Mujhe is situation mein kya karna chahiye? And if you abide in that, then also your gati is taken. You are, a, you are on the adhyatmic gati whether you recognize or not. You're already in the laws of abiding in the Shastra, Buddhi, and moving towards Atma Vidya, closer to acknowledging the fact. I think I'll stop here. 31st verse we will do tomorrow. And it's changing the flavor now. You can see the flavor of the gear changing to the verses. You saw the Atma gear, then you saw the immediate world gear, Vimharic world gear, and now it comes to the individual completely in the sense of identified as an individual with the body, gear shifted. What is me to do? What am I to do? Arjuna had that doubt. What should I do? Krishna has brought him to that point of saying, seeing what you should be doing. And he's giving him the formula based on this, understand and choose what you should do. So we will end here. They should put us. Mm. 
स्वस्ति प्रजाभ्य परिपालयन्ता न्यायेन मार्गेन महीमहिषा गोब्राह्मणे भ्यशुभमस्तु नित्यम् लोका समस्ता सुखिनो भवन्तु काले वर्षतु परजन्यः पृथ्वी सस्य शालिनी देशो यम क्षो भरहितः ब्रह्मणा संतु निर्भया शांति 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 ही